This week on States of America. I don't know what was going through my head. I just wanted my baby. We explore how news stories impact children. I can name several white women who have gone missing in the past 20 years. How many missing black women or girls can we name who are missing? In partnership with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, USA Today investigative reporter Gina Barton examines racial disparities in the cases of missing children and looks at how they're handled by both the police and the media. And USA Today education reporter Aliyah Wong examines the impact that the pandemic has had on small children and what it means for their development. If somebody took something of a toy of hers, even now she'll just like scream at the top of her lungs. I don't know if that's pandemic or her trauma. We're used to having daycares. We're used to being able to go to the library and have book time. And so when I ask parents about certain developmental milestones, there's a lot of questions. Alexis was the only child for many years. She loved to be around other kids. She always was saying she had this friend and that friend, like everybody was her friend. Alexis was very smart. She loved coming to school. She loved doing art, science. She liked all that stuff. She never, ever, ever missed school. I'm looking out the window because I normally see my baby walk. I watch my baby come home every day. So I ran across the street to the school. And when I went to the school and I asked Miss Rulin, where's Alexis? She turned around and she looked at me. I'll never forget her face. She said, Alexis didn't come to school today. I said, what? And she said, Alexis didn't come to school today. I don't know what was going through my head. I just wanted my baby. I started working at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in May of 2002. My first day was a Monday, and Alexis Patterson had disappeared the previous Friday. So first week on the job, Alexis being missing was a huge story. Alexis's case is very unique in terms of missing children because nobody saw what happened. It's like she just vanished out of thin air. There was a frenzy uh, approach of, there's someone missing in our community, a young one. We're going to put all the effort to work Hold no stops. The department took it very seriously. The officer came to my house and he took the police report. And then other officers came and detectives came. And then they said that she probably ran away. And I told the police my daughter didn't run away. They thought maybe she ran away. The police, like she didn't run away. She wasn't that type of child that would run away. I thought someone took my daughter. I know someone took my daughter. Everything anecdotally that I have heard and everything that experts have told me has shown that missing black children are more likely to be labeled runaways than missing white children. Salt Lake City is consumed by the disappearance of a teenage girl. A massive multi-state manhunt is underway. 14-year-old Elizabeth Smart is still missing. About a month after Alexis disappeared, Elizabeth Smart disappeared from her home in Utah. Elizabeth Smart's case hit national news almost immediately. How could it happen right in her own bedroom in an affluent community? Who could have done this? Within 24 hours of her disappearance, her family members were on at least three national cable news broadcasts. Elizabeth, if you're out there, 
We're doing everything we possibly can to help you. Although the local media really covered Alexis's case a lot, the national media didn't. Alexis's story didn't make the national news until six weeks after she had disappeared. And it's important for the national media to get involved because when people go missing, they don't necessarily stay in the same city that they were taken from or that they disappeared from. Not long after Alexis and Elizabeth disappeared, the late PBS reporter Gwen Ifill coined the term missing white woman syndrome. Beautiful, usually blonde, attractive white women get a lot more media attention than black women and girls who go missing. I can name several white women who have gone missing in the past 20 years. Natalie Holloway, Lacey Peterson, Gabby Petito, they're all over the news. And how many missing black women or girls can we name who are missing? All the research that I've seen and all the experts that I've talked to have said that white girls are looked at as helpless and as victims and as people in need of protection, whereas black girls are adultified and looked at as responsible for their own disappearances in some way. One theory is that the police are the ones who put out the news releases and give reporters information so that when they don't tell reporters about missing black children or adults, the reporters don't know, the reporters don't cover it. And another issue that has come up is implicit bias on both the part of police and journalists. Both of those fields are staffed by mostly white people. Elizabeth Smart, the Salt Lake City teenager kidnapped nine months ago, has turned up alive. I just don't think she's ever mattered because of who she is. You know, her being a little black girl and, you know, minority and from where she come from. When Alexis disappeared, she was seven years old. She's black. Her family lived in a relatively poor neighborhood in the city of Milwaukee. Elizabeth Smart, 14 years old, white, lived in a million dollar house in Salt Lake City, Utah. The other huge difference is that Elizabeth Smart, pretty much from the beginning, everybody knew she had been abducted because she shared a bedroom with her sister. And her sister, after a few hours, told her parents there was a man with a gun in their bedroom. Alexis and her mother had a little argument before school. Alexis had picked out some cupcakes that she wanted to bring to her class, but because she had not done her homework, Ayana told her she couldn't bring the cupcakes that day. So she was upset, but her stepfather, Laurent, walked her to the corner, handed her off to the crossing guard, and then went on to take her stepbrother to school. The police have told me that until they can definitively prove that Alexis's parents didn't have anything to do with her disappearance, they are not going to take them off the list. And when you have no evidence of anything, how can you prove anything? From my research, when children are missing, the first thing they do is look at the parents. So that didn't matter to me. I just wanted them to help me find my daughter. But when you just constantly, constantly suspecting me and you're not such other people, that's where I had the problem. I mean, if you know her, and if you've seen the way she raised her baby, you know, you know, she wouldn't let a mosquito bite her baby. We have to look at all angles and check off the box the most simplest things. And so starting with the family, unfortunately, is uh, you know, one of those uh, beginning points. 
And until that case is cleared with good solid evidence and that you have a individual individuals held accountable for it, everybody's on you know the table. The flaws in both the media coverage and the police investigation of Alexis's case aren't what happened in the early days. The flaws are that if she actually was abducted, the focus on her parents as suspects and so much effort being put in to try to find her kind of left some things undone in terms of trying to figure out who might have been responsible for taking her. Because if you think she's a runaway and she left of her own accord, you're not looking for a kidnapper. You're not looking for somebody who had done her harm. In 2016, the police got a tip that a woman in Ohio looked a lot like the age-progressed photo of Alexis. And so they coordinated with the police there to get this woman's DNA, and they compared it with Alexis's DNA. The police said it did not match, but Alexis's mother remains convinced that the woman in Ohio could be her daughter that because the Milwaukee police did not go to Ohio themselves, but rather trusted the authorities there to collect the DNA, that there could have been some sort of issue with collecting the DNA from the woman. The woman in Ohio told one of my colleagues that she was willing to give her DNA because she wanted to put an end to this poor mother's suffering and doubt, but she says she is definitely not Alexis Patterson. The lady in Ohio has the same mark under her right eye as Alexis has. Also, the lady in Ohio has the same bump on her left pinky finger as Alexis has. I personally feel and professionally feel if we could resolve a case, there's no reason why we wouldn't. Is it troublesome to hear that a mother would plead that we have something to do with hiding evidence or having um, a case being resolved. Absolutely. Uh, trust is a continuous process. Uh, it's not just a one-hit wonder. You uh, have to continue to nurture it. I would just like to thank everybody for coming out and supporting the 20th year of Alexis Patterson, Hear Our Voice Awakening. As a mother, I cannot even imagine how horrible it would be to have my child disappear. So I can't even imagine what Ayana must be going through 20 years later, not knowing what happened to her daughter. You know, to this day, I just can't get that, that picture out of my mind. You know, I still dream about it. I still dream about Alexis. I don't know, it's just something that you just, it never goes away. I don't even know how to explain the pain and the things that I've been going through. Just know that I've been surviving. I'm a spiritual warrior and I'm, I'm ready to fight. Who believed me when I said she coming home? Yes, Lord. I know Alexis is alive. I've always felt Alexis' spirit. I see Alexis when I'm woke. I see Alexis in my dreams. I see Alexis all the time. I tell her, come home, baby.
This fall is the third time that children will return to school during a pandemic. As we learn to adapt to the reality of living with COVID, experts are studying the impact it's had on our youngest generation. I spoke with dozens of pediatricians, psychologists, educators, and parents to try to understand how children born right before or during the COVID pandemic are developing. They told me that these children, sometimes called pandemic babies, are missing milestones at higher rates than usual and acting out more. They believe the isolation and stress of the pandemic are key reasons. I mean, I know like every parent thinks their child is the smartest child ever, and I, I firmly believe that, that she's very super intelligent. So totally clueless when at her 18 month appointment, the pediatrician's like, you know, how many words is she saying? She's like 12. I was expecting that to be a little low, but you know, just, you know, we're moving along. We're in a pandemic. And she's like, well, it should be about 50. And I'm like, okay, 15. well, 50. The first five years of life are critical to human development. That's because our brains grow more during that period than at any other point in our lifetimes. Recent studies show that babies born during the pandemic are vocalizing less and at a later age than pre-pandemic babies. Experts believe part of the problem stems from small children interacting with fewer people. I was really frustrated and disappointed with myself because here I was working nonstop from home. I took micro breaks to take care of her. So that meant I was working basically from nine to nine. She wanted all my attention. She didn't care if I was on meetings. Her nap times were getting less and less and shorter. So I was frustrated because I was like, I don't even have time to get out the crayons and draw with her. During the pandemic, COVID outbreaks temporarily shut down daycare centers and preschools, and many teachers quit because of low pay and stressful work conditions. Over the last two years, at least 16,000 childcare centers have permanently shut their doors. One of the most important things for a child is a stable, nurturing environment. I think the struggle with definitely social development has been at the top of the list. We're used to having daycares. We're used to being able to go to the library and have book time, and we're able you know, to go to music playtime and all of these different things. And that has really decreased. And so when I ask parents about certain developmental milestones, there's a lot of questions. She's a very intelligent girl. I think that the biggest thing for her is getting her behavior health needs met. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the first thing that we need to work on and what we have been working on. If somebody took something of a toy of hers, she'll just like scream at the top of her lungs. So she doesn't know how to work through her, her emotions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's pandemic or, or her trauma. CJ entered the foster care system when she was just a few months old. She was adopted by Jillian and Enosh during the pandemic in September of 2020. CJ's parents saw signs that she had been physically abused, but because of the pandemic, it took them almost six months to get an appointment with a pediatrician. One of the things, the hardest things for parents is navigating through the system. During the pandemic, it was so hard to get services, so hard to call people. I mean, before you could just show up if you couldn't get through and say, hey, I need this during the pandemic who were, everything was to be done online half of the time. I don't know how families who who were affected by the digital divide were even able to get services or if they got services. CJ's parents also struggled to find a daycare that they could afford. After many months of making do, they got lucky and found a spot in a preschool program for children in poverty. Daycares were almost non-existent. I was like some form of childcare. Thankfully, we were able to get in, and they kind of put her high up at the high end mm -hmm. um, because she was a foster kid. So it was a really good place for families like ours. There's still some things that she does that she does need assistance with, but I think we've conquered her behavioral health issues, her trauma issues. We've come a long way, and now she's starting to blossom. When I think of daycare centers or I think of um, school-based centers, I think of the fact that we have these amazing, burgeoning little human beings who are all influencing each other. And they're seeing that other child who has big emotions and learning how to control them, and they learn from that just by watching that. 
um, they learn that, you know, wow, my peer here is uh, potty training. Maybe I should get on that. And they're very good at watching and relating and then saying, how do I assimilate into this social environment? Do you know where your heart is? Where's my heart? In 2020, childcare costs increased at four times the rate of inflation. Three-year-old Nyla has never been in daycare. Her mother, Jessica, says she can't afford it. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> During the pandemic, Jessica lost her job and was forced to move in with her parents to get help. It's insane to find childcare during this time. It's hard, and it's so expensive. It is. And then you have to jump through so many hoops to apply for childcare subsidy. I mean, do you miss working? I miss it. Yeah. It's driving me up a wall. It's been too long. Too long. Jessica and Nyla have been participating in a child development and support program since she was a baby. They qualified in part because the family is on Medicaid and has a history of mental illness. And when Nyla was a newborn, she wasn't growing at the normal rate. I noticed she put a couple things about like her lashing out, you know, when she gets angry and whatnot. Yeah, we've been working on it. So like dealing with mental health, trying to find care for that, you know, um, either working or, you know, being home, looking for work, trying to find your own housing, you know, having enough to pay bills, rent. I mean, all this stuff is just compiled together for so many families. And it's hard to figure out how to dig the way out, isn't it? Just the stress alone, it, it, it kills me. But you've done a good job. You have, and you've kept her safe, and she's very healthy, and she's very smart. Oh, yeah. And, hey. you know, that's... If that's the a only thing it's... I do good in my life, I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> if I mess up every other aspect, I'm fine. But as long as she... I, just, I want her to have a childhood she does not have to recover from. So. <laughs> we all know that parents' mental health greatly affects you know, children's mental health. And I really have to explain that even in the infant and toddler period, maybe even more so in the infant and toddler period, in this prime brain growth time, that parents' mental health can affect their development. And so when I've seen parents who are under anxiety, who are under stress um, because of the pandemic um, or the, you know, repercussions of the pandemic, I definitely notice that also in the children and we have to discuss that and be open about it. It could be years before researchers can measure whether the pandemic will have any long-term or permanent effects on children. But they believe, in many cases, the social and developmental challenges that young kids have faced can be overcome. Any family should really think about the resources around them from the earliest age before there's an issue, before there's ever any trauma. We should be proactive. We should make sure that every child's early foundation is the best that it can be and utilize all the resources at our fingertips. And now that children under five are eligible for the vaccine, there's hope that this school year will be less disruptive. But so far, less than 5% of young children are fully vaccinated. Can I have a hug? Dolly. Oh. Dolly. I gotta go keep working, but it was, because I do, it's my job. I gotta go help another kiddo too.